This is the sermon for November 6th, 2022, and I want to talk about All Saints Sunday. I'm first going to read from Revelation 7, 9 through 17. I looked again. I saw a huge crowd, too huge to count. Everyone was there, all nations and tribes, all races and languages, and they were standing dressed in white robes and waving palm branches, standing before the throne and the Lamb, and they were heartily singing. The question came, who are these dressed in white robes and where did they come from? The answer was given, these have come through the great tribulation. That's why they're standing and singing. God and the Lamb will pitch a tent there for them. No more hunger, no more thirst, no more scorching heat. The Lamb on the throne will shepherd them and will lead them to spring waters of life. And God will wipe every last tear from their eyes. And then from 1 John 4, 7 through 18. Love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. If we love one another, God dwells deeply within us. There is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Well, this was one of those weeks that I started, wrote, and then erased the sermon that I had well begun. And, um, yeah, the last time was after thinking about Bev Bounds and her death just Friday, and I only heard of it late Friday. And her death came without any warning, and so that was tough for us, especially since... Um, she was in church every Sunday, um, by phone, yes, but she was in church and talking with us, so it did count, come as bit of a, a bit of a shock. We all know what it's like when we have no warning and are not ready uh, for such a loss. Of course, we know what it's like when we have warning, and even that, we're not ready for it, and it's tough, and that's why we are very glad for God to be so tenderly loving and wiping away every tear. And the tears are holy as well. So, yeah. Bev was one of the saints in, uh, in this Davis church and people have been through a lot in this church. She was consistently kind and gentle, giving and positive. Not the only one like that, but of course, Bev, an individual. I truly wish that I was more like her and I wanted her around longer so that I could continue to learn from her and try to be more like her in my life. Again, not the only one like that. She would argue with me if I described her like that, but she can no longer argue with me, so there you go, I'm saying it. I'm like most people, most regular people, a mixed bag of good qualities while also being difficult at times. And there are people who will tell you that, so you don't have to take my word for it. Even though Bev and the others that we named today are with God and with loved ones in heaven, we can continue to learn from their examples. That's a benefit of having known beautiful people. Everyone here knows someone like that. It's a blessing. But I want to talk about saints again. And saints are simply forgiven sinners, which we all are forgiven sinners. We are forgiven and loved deeply by God. And God enables us to love one another. We're all saints, forgiven and loved sinners, held and loved by God, no matter which side of the veil we are on. I'm so glad that we take one Sunday a year, All Saints Sunday, so we can remember our loved ones who have gone before us. They don't even have to be good church people. My mother was an example. She didn't go to church. She gave money to the church that I attended, but I was the only one in my family that went. That was Glenview United Methodist. So I still honor my mother on All Saints Sunday, and it's okay. God holds us all and that is grace. 
two things that we notice about this Revelations passage. The first is that these saints are ones who have come through the ordeal. They've come through the great tribulation. And they're happy because they've come through suffering and they've gone out to the other side. God and the Lamb will pitch a tent there for them. No more hunger, no more thirst, no more suffering, no more scorching heat. Of course, that was a big thing in desert uh, places. The Lamb will shepherd them, leading them to spring waters, and God will wipe away every last tear from their eyes. You all know I'm big on pitching tents and being sheltered. No more hunger or thirst. No more suffering. And we are shepherded by the Lamb, which is a great reversal of images. And we're brought to spring waters. Again, very important in a desert culture. And God, God will wipe every last tear oh so tenderly from our eyes. And that's generally uh, with God, the love of a mother who wipes tears from our eyes. Dads can do it too. And uh, men wipe tears tenderly. Um, in my family, it would have been my mother who, were, who would have been wiping tears. And sadly, she died when I was only 20 years old. But the scene in this Revelations passage is a huge crowd from every race, language, and nationality, uh, a great, vast throng. And uh, I laugh sometimes because for those who don't like foreigners, here it is in heaven. And uh, people from every people and language and race, uh, heaven's full of them, people of great, great variety. The lamb becomes a shepherd, which is a picture of vulnerability and smallness. No mighty warrior here on a great white war horse. Instead, it's a lamb. And it's okay for everyone to say, aww, <laughs> and to get a sense of the tenderness of God in that. It's quite the image of heaven in Revelations. And of course, we all need a little more of that tenderness. And then we have the first John passage. Love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. If we love one another, God dwells deeply within us. Love connects all of us on both sides of the veil. Love connects us and dwells deeply in us. And we call that love God. It's one way we understand love. There's no room in love for fear, which is an interesting part of the passage. Well-formed love banishes fear. Those are almost hard words, and they're hard to understand. Um, and so I want to look at that today. This could be a soft passage about love until we get to the end, where it talks about, you know, sure, God is love. Love is God. God dwells deeply within us when we love. It's all great. But then love banishes fear. How much are we driven by fear in our lives? And to say that there's no room in love for fear, well, it's human to fear. So there's nothing soft about that. We talk about worry and stress and anxiety all the time in our culture. In fact, politics is driven by fear. Um, the ways that we misbehave toward one another often driven by fear. Uh, Michelle de Montaigne once said, My life has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. And that's kind of a humorous way of looking at all the things we're afraid of that don't happen. And people who are busy, busy, busy. And again, that is the American way to have anxiety, to have fear, and to have stress. And why do we feel so overwhelmed? Why are we so busy? We feel overwhelmed. Why do folks choose to be busy, 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 especially the American way? Largely, it's fear. If they don't need me, then who am I? If they don't depend on me, they might fire me. Or maybe because we're busy, busy, busy to make money. And again, if people care about that more than anything else, why? Maybe because it's a fear of running out of money. 
I, in all my years in church, I have not seen people in church who are genuinely hungry because they've run out of money in order to buy food without a helpful neighbor or a food pantry in the area. Of course, we work uh, for food pantries in our area, which people do take advantage of. And I remember hearing wonderful stories from 60, 70 years ago when neighbors would bring food by and they might not even leave a note. They would just leave the food. So we do understand that in the church. And we support food pantries because we don't want children hungry. We don't want anyone going hungry. And yet, there's often in our society that we tend to be ruled by fear. I walk around being nervous and fearful a lot. And what does that say about my maturity and love? Not much. Uh, it's an area in which I need more work, for sure. I sometimes am afraid of being late for something, and then I might snap at some poor innocent bystander because I'm fearful. And I don't like that in me. I don't like it when I don't act my best because I'm afraid. That's what it comes down to. So even I have a mixed bag of good and poor behavior. What if we loved and what if we knew we were loved in a way that didn't allow for any fear, anxiety, worry, and stress? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being so suffused by love, so full of love that we don't have any worry or stress? What would that be like? When we're newborn, we're held and we're loved, and I swear we know deep down that we're loved by God. At some point, that somehow gets broken, and we spend the rest of our lives trying to return to knowing it with varying degrees of success. We're saints, we're forgiven sinners, we're growing to maturity in Christ, and we are maturing in love, love, genuine love, and that kind of love crowds out fear. Laughter helps us know about genuine love, and for me, being in nature helps me know God's genuine love. When I sit with people and listen, and I appreciate strengths in them that maybe others don't see, then I know genuine love. What are the ways that you experience genuine love? And is it deep enough, is it true enough that it crowds out fear and stress? and worry? I hope so. I hope it does. You know, sometimes dancing around the house to fun music is a way that we can laugh and learn about love, and it can crowd out fear. How does love crowd out fear for you? And how can we experience that in conversations that we share together? When we're convinced that we're no good and we're convinced that we're not worthy of love, that's not part of God's story for us. And have you ever wondered if you're living in the wrong story? If you are, then how do you get out of that wrong story? <clears throat> if you're living in an old, untrue, broken story, if you find yourself in the wrong story, then leave. And of course, you know, I hope that we live in the story of love given, love received, love shared, love remembered. Sometimes we're deeply afraid of things, struggling with a question that feels like the end of all that is good, that is fearful and not true to genuine love. Sometimes the things we're most afraid of don't happen. Things that never happen, 40% of the things we worry about um, things over and past that can't be changed by all the worry and stress in the world, that's about 30% of what we worry about. Um, sometimes we worry about our health, that's maybe 12%. Most of it doesn't come true. And sometimes we worry about small, inconsequential things, that's maybe 10 to 12%. And then real, legitimate worries, about 4 to 8% of all that we worry about. The rest, it's insubstantial. So 92% of what we worry about, maybe even 96% of what we worry about, 
has no substance to it at all. And so the question is, what would you do if you weren't afraid right now? How would you live differently? And in the meantime, how do we live in love, in substantial love given to us by God? And how do we share that with one another? Amen.